Welcome to a Mark Wilson Psych 232 home video production. What I want to do is quickly talk through once again the independent samples t-test but I'm going to do a bit more to focus on how the number that comes out the other end of the t, of the t distribution is actually meaningful or useful in making a decision about the nature of differences in our groups. Now remember, all statistical tests are a measure of the variability that we think is due to our effect compared to the variability that occurs in our population generally. There are a variety of different statistical tests that are based on this, this premise. They include the t-test, the ANOVA, correlation, chi-squared, and a variety of others. Now, in the case of the independent samples t-test, we have one IV, one independent variable, with two levels. So we're comparing group 1 with group 2. The data can be at interval or ratio, uh, ratio level, and they, it needs to be the case. There needs to be a meaningful difference between 1 or 2, for example. Before I show you the equation for the t-test, essentially what it boils down to is a ratio of the difference between two groups against the within sample variability. So here we have two distributions, the black line down the center indicates the mean point. We have a difference between the means, and at the bottom we have a measure of the, the sample variability. Effectively what the t-test does is to produce a number at the other end which represents the ratio of this gap here to something about the within sample variability. Ideally what we want is a t-value that is of large magnitude. It can be positive or negative, but it needs to be large. The question is, how large does it need to be in order for us to infer that there's something meaningful about the data that we've collected? So, the equation effectively reflects this. The difference between the two groups, in this case the difference between the mean of group 1 taking away the mean of group 2. We then divide that by a version of the within sample variability and the way we calculate that is by looking at the variance of group 1 dividing it by its own, the number of observations in group 1, add the variance of group 2 divided by the number of observations in group 2 and then we take the square root which has the effect of making that number smaller. If we take the Example data that I've shown you previously, where I've invited people to complete the paranormal belief scale under one of two conditions, either conditions in which I've told them it's perfectly okay to believe in paranormal phenomena, and in the second set of conditions where it's probably not a good idea to agree with that, we can see we've got uh, a difference between the groups. The means are not exactly the same. In the case of the pro-belief condition, the means 86 points on the scale versus 72 in the anti-belief condition. The standard deviations are approximately similar, and we're going to need the variances when it comes to calculating the t-value at the other end. So, we subtract the mean of group 2 from the mean of group 1, divide that by the variance of group 1 divided by the number of observations, add the variance of group 2 divided by the number of observations, and then we take the square root of that number. The other end, we end up with 14.07, the difference between the two groups, divided by 6.85, which is our uh, proxy for within, group, uh, within sample variation. Ultimately, that gives us a t-value of 2.05. Yay! We've taken a whole bunch of information, the means and variances for our two groups, and we've now got a single number out the other end that hopefully we can use to make a decision about whether or not something um, has happened to the, the paranormal belief scale means on the basis of the experimental conditions in which people participated. And that's where we move on to understanding the T distribution. Remember, our null hypothesis is that there's no effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. That's to say, paranormal belief scales scores should not don't actually differ meaningfully across the two groups, versus a research hypothesis in which we can have two possible versions. Firstly, that there is an effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. In this particular case, I'm not necessarily claiming that um, one of the belief scale scores should be higher than the other. But if I were to do so, that would take it from being a non-directional hypothesis to being a directional one. So what we need is a p-value, a probability associated with the likelihood of getting the t-value that we've observed at the other end of our equation due to chance alone. Essentially, what we're looking to see is whether or not the data we've got is likely to have come from a single population or from two populations. Our null hypothesis is that they are effectively taken from a single population. And by convention in psychology and other social sciences, we accept something as being probably meaningful if the chance of that t-value occurring is 5% or less. 
Now our t-value would be zero if there was no difference between the groups. If the two group means were exactly the same, we'd end up with a t-value of zero. If the second group mean is smaller than the first, we'll end up with a positive t-value. If the second value, the second group, from which we, sub uh, that we subtract from the first group's mean is larger, then we'll end up with a negative t-value. By chance, t will sometimes be bigger than zero and sometimes it'll be smaller. But how often? This is a t-distribution. It's a t-distribution with seven degrees of freedom. The axis up the y is not specified, but this is the frequency. So, for example, we notice in the middle of our distribution we have a t-value of zero, and we can see by this frequency distribution that we would expect if we ran a whole bunch of t-tests uh, on random data with seven degrees of freedom, we would expect that the most common result we would get would be zero. A small number of the observations would be greater than what turns out to be the critical t-value for a, uh, a t-distribution with seven degrees of freedom, 2.365. And some of them will be smaller than the negative end. The t-distribution has different shapes depending on the number of degrees of freedom. If we have very few, then it's a bit flatter and there's a little bit more uh, space down. It's a, it takes us a little bit further uh, into the extreme values to get to our 5%. If we have more degrees of freedom, in fact, it starts to look more normal. And therefore, we can have a lower critical t-value in order to decide that something is meaningful. So, if my t is very big, then it's very unlikely my two means come from the same, the same sample population. But what does it really mean in practice? I think this is the thing that makes it confusing. We're not talking about distributions of the actual data anymore. We're talking about the distribution of the test statistic that comes out the other end of the equation that I've shown you. So let's imagine that we make a data set. In fact, I have. I've used SPSS to generate a thousand random numbers. Each of those random numbers is drawn from a population with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. But then I've subdivided them further into a hundred sets of ten random numbers, and within those sets of ten random numbers, I've split them further into two groups of five. What I'm going to end up doing is a hundred t-tests on each of our groups of five pieces of random data. If you want to, you can actually generate random variables in SPSS exactly this way by using the syntax below. So here's my data set. It's on Blackboard. It's called marks n equals 1,000 random numbers, etc., etc. You can have a look at it if you wish. Um, you can have a quick look here. We've got uh, three columns of data. The first is the trial. This varies between 1 and 100. There are 10 examples of 1, 10 examples of 2, 3, 4, so on and so forth. Within each of those trials, we have two groups of five. They're either going to be given the value of one or two, and there are five numbers in each. If we actually have a look at the descriptive statistics for my random number by going analyze, descriptive statistics, descriptives, selecting random var as the variable we want to look at, it produces something which shows us we've got a mean across our thousand random numbers, not quite zero, but pretty close. The standard deviation isn't quite one, but well, it's pretty close. Um, but we do have some fairly extreme negative numbers and some fairly extreme positive numbers as well. Remember, these have been generated randomly, and that's going to be important in a second. I split the data into 100 sets. What I'm doing really is I'm telling SPSS to run the same t-test, but it's going to compare the t-test results across, in this case, anything that's got a different number for trial. I do this by going data, compare groups, I move trial into the groups based on box, click OK, and from this point on, any analysis I do will be done a hundred times. It's going to be done once for each of the values of trial. We run an independent samples t-test. Analyze, compare means, independent samples t-test, which brings up this box here. We move random var, our test variable, into the test variables box. We select group as our grouping variable, and the moment you do that, this box here, Define Groups, goes black and allows you to click on it, where you can then enter groups one and two. These are the two groups we're going to compare on our random var. First bit of output we get is the group statistics. Remember, I've got a, because I've asked it to split by trial, I'm going to get a hundred examples of group one versus group two, mean, standard deviation, so on and so forth. So for my first trial, the means of the two groups are different by about 0.4, but only by less than 0.10 for my second group. 
and the difference for trial 3 is even less. Note that even though these are random numbers drawn from the same population, which is data with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1, the groups don't have the same means. In fact, the t-values we get out the other end are also quite different. So, for example, the t-value for that first pair of five pieces of data uh, is minus 0.78. Minus 0.11 for the second trial. Minus 0.06 for the third. Now, remember that trial three was the one which had a very, very small difference between the means, and in fact, the probability of getting that difference between the means due to chance alone is about 0.95, 95% of the time. I've then gone on and I've taken out all of these t values and I put them into their own data set. Because what I'm going to do in a second is show you what the distribution, the frequency distribution of those t-values is. But before we even uh, look at that distribution, if you look at the mean and standard deviations of our t-values, remember we've moved on from our group differences, we're now looking at the means and standard deviation for the t-value, the mean of those t's is somewhere close to zero. Remember our hypothetical t-value distribution where the most frequent results would be in the middle at zero? Well, it's pretty similar. Standard deviation is a little bit over 1, but notice importantly that some of our t-values are strongly negative, and some of our t-values are strongly positive, even though the data was randomly generated. If we plot the frequency distribution of those t-values, and I've asked SPSS to overlay a normal distribution, we can see that it looks roughly normal. Not perfectly normal, we've got a couple of extreme negatives, uh, where we don't have quite as extreme positives, but if I was to generate 2,000 random numbers, do exactly the same thing, or 4,000 or 8,000, this will get increasingly normal. This here is a table of critical t-values. Remember back in the day, people didn't have SPSS to tell them the exact significance level of the uh, statistic that they've obtained. Instead we have to go and have a look at our Eaton's tables. We would look down the table that corresponded to the value of p that we're interested in, so p less than 0.05 is our, you know, our minimal threshold. We would then look down until we find 8 degrees of freedom. Remember the degrees of freedom for an independent samples t-test are the number of observations minus the number of groups. We've got 100 groups of 10 variables, uh, sorry, 10 data, 10 pieces of data split into two groups. 10 minus 2 equals 8. And that tells us that the t-value that we need to obtain um, in order to uh, be confident that we would only get that t-value 5% or less of the time is 2.31. If we have a look at our actual randomly generated t-distributions, you can see that something like 2.5% of our t-values exceed 2.31. Something like 2.5% of our t-values are smaller than minus point, uh, sorry, minus 2.31. So, even though these random numbers are random, the t values that come out the other end are based on random data, we still find that something like 5% of, of, of the, the t values we'll obtain are going to be greater than or less than our critical value of t. So this is important. Just because the p value is less than 0.05 doesn't mean the result is due to ran isn't due to random variation it just means that it's less likely than the reverse to have occurred by random variation so there you go remember this isn't about a t test this is this is about how a t test or any statistical test works um, but you de don't need to do it for yourself spss will generate the exact significance level for you this is however an indication of how spss actually reaches that Point. How do we know that the statistical value that we've obtained is likely to occur less than 5% of the time just by chance alone? If you want, you can go onto Blackboard, pull out the data sets and have a look at them yourselves, see whether or not you can actually get the same results as I do. And more importantly, I hope that this uh, resolves some of the confusion around the distinction between the distribution of the actual data and the distribution of the t-values at the other end.